Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth, presented by the Associates for Biblical Research. I'm your host, Henry Smith. In our last episode, we were having a conversation with Dr. Titus Kennedy about his book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus, and he's back for part two today to continue our discussion. Titus, good to have you back, my friend. Yeah, thanks for bringing me back. All right. You know, it just occurred to me that uh, uh, we want to talk about the trial of Jesus. This is something that you've studied very carefully. But let's wrap up one point uh, that I think is really important that you, we were talking about in the last uh, episode. We were talking about the James ossuary, which is a bone box. And it says, uh, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. You mentioned this phraseology is also found uh, in Josephus. Could you talk about the phraseology and the significance of it um, and its importance? Sure. So the inscribers are trying to be very specific in order to identify who this person is. And I think, as we explained with the brother part tacked on, <clears throat> this is somebody who would be well known and who was important. But <clears throat> if you look in the writings of Josephus, he's aware of the familial relationship because. He, he says that James is the brother of, of Jesus. And so people were aware of that relationship. And we don't know of any other James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And so it's, it's a plausible assertion to make that this inscription is talking about James of the Jerusalem church, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And again, we encourage folks to pick up a copy of Dr. Kennedy's book to check out his arguments and evidence related to the James Ossuary. Okay, now, uh, speaking of, of d things associated with death, we want to move ourselves to the farcical trial of Jesus, this plot to murder him, the only innocent man ever to live, who is caught up in this, in this plot. Um, let's talk about the trial, because you've done quite a bit of work on this, and it's really fascinating, the historical and archaeological trail that we can find related to the trial of Jesus. The trial of Jesus is one of my favorite narratives from an archaeological standpoint because of the massive amount of corroborating evidence that we have for the people and the places and the protocols or the, the historical context. Now, we've got Jesus, obviously, but then we also have Annas, the high priest. We've got Caiaphas, the high priest. We've got Pilate, the governor. We've got Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee. And we could even throw in some side characters in there like Peter and also Simon of Cyrene. And then, of course, we have locations. So he, he gets arrested first in the Garden of Gethsemane. So we could start off there. And then he's brought to the house of the high priest. So there's two. And then he's also brought before the Sanhedrin, the council. And then he is taken to the Praetorium. And then if we were to go after that, we obviously look at the crucifixion site. But so at least, you know, four locations, three of them, which are structures, buildings. And then we've got a minimum of five characters. Well, all these things are, are tested archaeologically. All right. So uh, maybe we could start with, uh, let's see, uh, Probably the most famous figure people known that uh, made its way into the Apostles' Creed. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So let's talk about his office a little bit and the Praetorium, uh, perhaps, if you'd like to do that. So Pilate was what the Romans called a prefect. So this was a type of governor. And <clears throat> as such, uh, he, he had authority over certain things like capital punishment. And so that's the reason why the religious leaders of Judaism had to bring Jesus to Pilate to get him to sign off on the, the, the execution of Jesus. But we know some things about Pilate from Roman history, ancient writings, where he is referenced here and there, uh, early Christian sources also. But also in 1961, uh, excavations at Caesarea Maritima discovered this stone with a Latin inscription that was some kind of dedication to Tiberius by Pilate, and it gives his name, Pontius Pilatus, and his, his title, Prefect of Judea. And then much more recently, 
a ring that had been discovered at Herodium long ago was finally cleaned and noticed, and it had Pilate's name and a symbol on it. It said Pilato in Greek, so it's the same form of his name in the New Testament. So, you know, Pilate is a very well-attested person, governor, prefect of Judea. Then you mentioned the praetorium where part of the trial happened. And usually, tour groups, at least in the past, were brought to the Antonia Fortress area in Jerusalem. And sometimes they were shown this stone pavement, but that's actually from the second century when Hadrian did a rebuilding of Aelia Capitolina. So the, the Praetorium, we actually know from Roman sources, first century sources, like Josephus and Philo talk about this, that the governors used the former palace of Herod the Great. So that was on the west side of the city. And in the 1970s, there were some excavations done there uh, with uh, Broshi and Shimon Gibson was part of that. And they uncovered this gateway and they uncovered a stone pavement and they uncovered a bima area. And I think this structure that fits John's description also of Gabatha, like a raised place, which looks very much like uh, bima areas in, in some other cities of the Roman world, like Corinth, for example. And you can actually see that still today. It's just that most people don't know where it is and it doesn't have a clear signage for it. But we have probably the place where Pilate and Jesus were standing as part of that trial took place. Yeah, and you, you just imagine if you're able to go there, if you ever go to Jerusalem, a person watching, uh, you know, that there's the question asked, you know, what Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? You know, that these events are taking place there. They're placed, and you mentioned all these names, Herod Antipas, the buildings, the, the, the Pontius Pilate, of course, the, that, the whole context. This is no myth. This is, a, this is so rooted in historical circumstances and peoples. Maybe uh, just comment on that, maybe for about 45 seconds or so, Titus, please. Yeah, it's completely different than a myth. So <clears throat> myths will often have some general geographic locale that they use. And then most of the characters are not historical. Maybe a couple of major ones are, but the actions that they take are not. And most of the other people are made up. Totally not the case here, because it's not like it just says it happened in Judea province or even in Jerusalem. We get the specific buildings and we've located those archaeologically. Hall of Hewn Stone on the south side of the Temple Mount was where the Sanhedrin met. The Praetorium, we've got uh, three houses of the high priest, possibly, that it could be. I think one is a better candidate. But all of the characters we mentioned, we have historical texts and uh, ancient inscriptions and like the tomb for Annas, for example. So they're attested archaeologically through a variety of methods demonstrating the, the historicity of you know, people and places. And then we have other historical sources referring to the trial of Jesus. Excellent. Well, and, and on top of all that, we also have the Caiaphas ossuary, which you talk about in the book as well, the bones of the high priest who was involved in the conspiracy to murder our Lord. Well, friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth today. We're here with Dr. Ken Titus Kennedy, and we'll be right back after this break. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Hi, welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith. I'm here today with Dr. Titus Kennedy. We're talking about his book, Excavating the Evidence for Jesus. We want to encourage you to pick it up in the ABR bookstore. Okay, Titus, we were talking about uh, the trial of Jesus, the, the buildings and the persons involved with that, very historical. Uh, one thing you wanted to talk about a little bit was what we call Pilate's Dilemma. 
regarding the trial. Tell the audience about that and some of your reflections on that. Well, in the Gospel of John's section on the trial narrative, he mentions this quotation where the religious leaders say that if Pilate doesn't do what they want, execute Jesus, that he will be no friend of Caesar. So this was political terminology. A friend of Caesar was someone who had the support of the emperor. And of course, you wanted that as a Roman politician, because if you lost that, you could be in serious trouble. Maybe you would just lose your position, but you could also be exiled somewhere or, or even executed if you did something to warrant such drastic circumstances. And Pilate had been in a, a variety of mix-ups with the local populace already. So he was a governor in Judea for, for 10 years, which was actually a very long time. And he was probably a typical Roman governor, ruling as others did with an iron fist sometimes. But uh, this got him in trouble in Judea and that there were multiple complaints against him. Things like the, the shields of the emperor that he put up in Jerusalem or maybe the eagle symbols or using the temple treasury to build an aqueduct, even if it may have been to supply the temple. So these were things that were offending the Jews. And so they sent official delegations to Caesar to complain. And Pilate was already kind of in a spot where he didn't need any more complaints. Otherwise, he might get sent home and then you'll see what happens. But in 31 AD, there was this whole Sejanus affair. So those that are familiar with Roman history will know something about this. Uh, Sejanus was the ruler of the Praetorian Guard. And over the years, he had amassed power to where he was almost acting emperor. Tiberius was off on the island of Capri, not really interested in running day-to-day -day things, and Sejanus had been amassing more and more power. Well, this turned into a conspiracy, basically, and the Senate ended up assassinating him, you know, faking that he was going to be made emperor and then assassinating him. They killed also many members of his family and uh, political allies. And so Pilate, even if he had no direct connection to Sejanus, was in a place where you didn't want to make the emperor mad at this point in time. And we can see then from history that in 36, Pilate actually had one more incident in the province and there was a complaint against him and he got recalled to Rome. Now, Tiberius died before he got there, uh, but Pilate, who knows what would have happened to him? Exile, execution, we're not sure, but he, he was under the impression and the correct impression that if he didn't do what they wanted, he probably was going to be kicked out of his governorship. Uh, that's great. That's great background material. And that's the background material of the expression, you know, no friend of Caesar. You know, it's kind of like you're no friend of Darth Vader. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's sort of bring a specter of fear even over a soldier like Pontius Pilate. Very understandable, very contextual historical. Okay, so now let's shift to after the crucifixion, we want to talk about the tomb because, you know, that's a, a really important point. And we have the tradition at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. There's been uh, work done related to that. It's been refurbished lately and some tests were done. But talk about the church and the tomb there and that tradition. So this, the tradition for this church definitely goes back to the fourth century, but, but as I see it, it goes back to the first century. Why would I say that? Now, there are claims in the fourth century that, and the fifth century also, but that this was the tomb of Jesus that Hadrian had built a temple over the top of it. And so Hadrian did this at a number of sites associated with Jesus in a, a campaign to try to erase the historical memory of Christianity and, and to syncretize things with Roman religion. So he built a grove to Adonis over the birthplace site in Bethlehem. He built a temple to the healing goddess Clepius over the pool of Bethesda, probably built a shrine to the nymphs over the pool of Siloam, and then he built this double temple to Jupiter and Venus over the tomb of Jesus. And in, yet in so doing, I think he actually helped preserve the location. And so 
we can say just from those items that people certainly thought this was the tomb of Jesus. But if we look into the details of the tomb and, and the immediate area around it, archaeologically, architecturally, we see there's an even stronger argument. That is that we know archaeologically this area was a quarry that then was then turned into a garden in the first century BC and then used as a graveyard. There are other first century tombs very close to the tomb of Jesus and the Holy Sepulchre. And then if we look at the architecture of the tomb itself, it is a stone cut arcosolium single chamber tomb that was sealed by a stone. Now, not only does all that fit the gospels, but this single chamber component is extremely important because there are no other single chamber tombs of this type from Roman period Jerusalem area at all. Uh, this tells us that it wasn't used in the normal sense that the other tombs were as a family tomb, and it was never reused either. So there was this immediate recognition that it was important that it was the tomb of Jesus. And because of that, the local residents didn't reuse it later on. That's a, that's a fascinating array of evidence that connects all of that. And, and it's, it's really interesting to see the, the convergence of archaeology, tradition, and the biblical text sort of all coming together. And you weave that very well in the book on this particular subject and all throughout it. Well, uh, we're going to go to a break now, Titus. And friends, thank you for joining us for Digging for Truth. We'll be back right after this message. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research, written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint. Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence, properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Hi, welcome to Digging for Truth. I'm your host, Henry Smith, and we're here with Dr. Titus Kennedy, who's an archaeologist, written several books. Today we're talking about his book about Jesus, uh, excavating the evidence for Jesus. Now, Titus, uh, we've, we've been through uh, quite a tour of, of evidence, and you have a lot more in the book that you, that you go through. You provide sources for people to have further study. It's easy to read for the layperson who's not familiar with archaeology, but gives them enough if they want to go further. So let's talk, let's shift the discussion now to talk about historians and philosophers that mention the name of Jesus, either manuscripts or inscriptions and that kind of thing, because this is really... This is cool stuff. Uh, let's talk about it. So just within the first and second centuries, we have 11 references to Jesus Christ by historians and philosophers. So this is material outside of the New Testament. And the vast majority of these are non-Christian sources. So we're, we're getting different people's perspective. We're getting Jewish perspective. We're getting Roman polytheistic perspective primarily. And then we are getting, you know, a couple of Christian perspectives from people who were Romans that converted. And so we, we can see that they must have thought that there was something to this if they were willing to convert. And, you know, I'm not talking about local Judeans becoming Christians either. I'm talking about people in the Roman Empire who were outside of the immediate sphere of influence. So I think that is really powerful evidence, first of all, just demonstrating the historical existence of Jesus, because this is something that often comes up in popular culture or, or even in classes in high school, maybe even college, that there's no historical evidence outside of the Bible that Jesus existed. And that's not something that professional scholars in this field would say or take seriously, but it does get circulated a lot. And so I wanted to provide at the end of the book sort of a, an appendix on this so that people could look at who are these authors, you know, what's the what's their name, what's their position, their date that they're writing this thing, the source, and then a quotation of it translated so that they can read that for themselves and see that it's not just, hey, we're throwing out a number, a bunch of people said Jesus existed. 
Yeah, that's good. And you know, you know, on our program, when we critique uh, uh, alternative ideas or sometimes bad ideas, we try to be as, as, as generous as we can. But we have to be honest, uh, the idea that Jesus, the argument that Jesus didn't e exist is just a foolish absurdity, and we ought to call it that. But at the same time, we show the reasons why we try to bear and be patient with people. I should mention, we had Dr. Craig Evans on for two episodes to talk about Jesus and the mythicists. So if someone's interested in that, uh, we urge you to watch those shows where that's developed further. Um, so let's talk about uh, some of these uh, sources. What are, what are some of your favorites, uh, Titus? Wh which ones do you like the most, or do you think pa pack the most powerful punch? Well, really, the Josephus one is very powerful, I think. Although people claimed in the past that it was a Christian interpolation or modification, when that 10th century Arabic version was found, I think that that changed the perspective on things and showed us that Josephus was just recording what people had been saying, what they'd been reporting about the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, that he had disciples. And then it says that they reported that he had appeared to them three days later. You know, he doesn't say that he believes that, but he is at least saying, here's what people are thinking. But, you know, we also have uh, people like Celsus, who is a second century Roman who was very harsh critic of Christianity. And yet he talks about the birth of Jesus and, and going to Egypt and the miracles. And he talks about, you know, weird business with the virgin birth and, and Jesus claiming to be God and so forth. So there are some really important things that he it brings up and that he's aware of that tells us that the church didn't just invent things like the virgin birth and, you know, Joseph being a carpenter, Jesus going to Egypt, Jesus performing miracles, Jesus saying he was God. This was known even to critics of Christianity not long after 100 AD and, and perhaps, you know, before that too. Yeah, it, you know, it, it's interesting. We call these, uh, if you want to call it a forensic kind of way of, you call them hostile witnesses because they, they don't have any skin in the game. You know, uh, I think it's unfair to the Christian sources to sort of dismiss those. But if you were to accept the premise that they could be dismissed, you, you have these hostile sources. Another one is in the Talmud. You know, they, they, they completely acknowledge the existence of Jesus. They reject him, of course. They even talk about his miracles. Uh, but he, they, you know, they say that uh, they were due to the power of Satan, which is, of course, blasphemous. But so we've got a lot there, uh, Titus. Now, you mentioned also uh, a graffito, uh, Alex Menos graffito. Could you talk about that a little bit? I thought that was really interesting. This is what we have uh, as far as the earliest artistic depiction of the crucifixion of Jesus. And it was found in Rome on the Palatine Hill on a wall of a building. So it, it was something that had been etched there uh, by workers or soldiers or slaves. And, and then there was actually a response to it. But it's mocking Christianity and Jesus. So it shows Jesus on the cross being crucified, but he, it gives him the head of a donkey. And then it shows this Christian whose name was Alexamenos, and it says that he is worshiping his God. So to them, the crucifixion was ridiculous, ludicrous, because they can't imagine a, a deity undergoing this capital punishment that was reserved for non-citizen criminals. And Paul you know, writes about this to the Hellenistic mindset, that this was just something that, they, that made no sense to them, right? And yet, like you talked about the hostile witnesses, this is a very important piece of evidence that demonstrates the historicity of the crucifixion of Jesus. And again, that it was widespread knowledge. People knew about it, even in Rome. You know, this dates to about 100 to 200 AD. So it's, it's not too long after the time of Jesus and attesting to this event and his personhood. That's great. All right, Titus, I'm going to give you the uh, difficult task of giving us a 30 second summary because we've come down to the end, my friend. Uh, 30 seconds to wrap it all up in any way that you would like. So if we were to put the New Testament aside and just look at other sources for the life of Jesus, we, we could actually reconstruct so much of what the New Testament and the Gospels talks about archeologically and from other ancient historical texts. 
regarding his birth in Bethlehem and all these locations, some of which we've talked about in this show, locations of his birth, locations of his uh, childhood and growing up, ministry, trial, crucifixion, burial, and all these events in his life that he was a teacher, he had disciples, he performed miracles, he claimed that he was God. You know, all this stuff we have corroborated by sources outside the New Testament. And there's an incredibly strong case then for the life of Jesus and the reliability of the Gospels. Amen. And, in, and you make a great case in your book, and we urge people to pick it up. Titus, thanks for all you do, and thanks for coming on the show again. Yeah, thank you for having me. My pleasure. All right. It's great to have you. Friends, thank you for watching Digging for Truth. We urge you to pick up a copy of Dr. Kennedy's book, and we thank you for watching our show. Have a great day.